Hepiniz hoş geldiniz. Bugün Welcome everyone. Today we have Dr. Antarnik Dakesian with us, who will talk about from Armenians in Lebanon to Lebanese Armenians. He is from the Haigazian University, Armenological the Department of Armenian Studies, and he is also the Executive Secretary of the Haigazian Armenological Review. After the 1980s, his articles mainly published on the cultural and economic sides of the Armenians in Lebanon. And after this presentation on the 12th of January, he will, together with Dikran Zarganyan from the National Library Director, he will have another speech with us. We look forward to seeing you for that presentation as well. And welcome once again and good evening. Hi, everybody. I'll be speaking in English. Uh, I don't understand Turkish. I don't know what she said. Okay, so if she said bad things, I don't know. I, I don't think she will, Yani. She would. But uh, I take it, whatever she says, because uh, I, have, I, I have to admit that this is a very emotional moment for me, uh, because it's the, for the first time I'm being in uh, Turkey. And um, it's a good experience to encounter uh, friends, uh, encounter brothers and sisters who are humans like I am. <coughs> uh, okay. Uh, I may I may speak too long, so you cut you cut me short, please. Uh, I don't know how do I start, and uh, but then, well, let me start. Um, I'll be speaking about I'll be speaking about the Lebanese Armenians, uh, the the transformation of the last 100 years of the Armenians in Lebanon. Well, we have to just just as an introduction, I want to say that um, the numbers of the Armenians back in uh, before the genocide they were, they were not that many. They were not more than 2,000 at most. Uh, as of the 1920s, their number got increased, and uh, in 1932, for instance, they were around 32,000. In 1975, they were over 225,000. <clears> what I'm trying to say is that um, uh, these, uh, well, in average, around 100,000 Armenians lived in, uh, lived in uh, Beirut or Lebanon for a period of over uh, half a century, for a period of 75 years. So this 100,000 Armenians, this, uh, this community, uh, during these 75 years, what did they do? Did they create anything? Did they produce anything? So I'll be speaking about this aspect rather than anything else. Uh, as I said, the story of an average of uh, uh, of 100,000 diaspora Armenians, their life and socio-economic and cultural output for almost a century in Lebanon. Um, Regarding the history of the Armenians in Lebanon, we can divide this history into two parts, two ba basic ma major sections, the pre-genocide uh, period and the post-genocide period. And the post-genocide period, I mean as of the 1920s, because it's very interesting uh, that uh, right after the genocide, Armenians didn't come to Lebanon didn't go to Lebanon in this case. I'm, I'm, th I'm seeing myself as, in, as if I am in Lebanon. Okay, so I'm, I repeat myself, that the Armenians didn't go, didn't, weren't taken to Lebanon. All around, not more than 4,000 Armenians were uh, exiled to a, an area in uh, Baalbek, in, um, uh, in the hinterlands, and to, ba to Rayak in particular, because there was a railway station there while no other Armenians were sent or exiled to Beirut or the area. Now, this, I'm talking about 1915. After 1915, back in, uh, then after that, in 1918, uh, the, the exiled Armenians returned to uh, Cilicia and wherever, okay? But there, on their way back, they came to Beirut. And there was a quarantine and there was a refugee camp. There, is, there was established a refugee camp for them in 1917-18. Okay? So, uh, but definitely in, in 1915, we, uh, the Armenians didn't go to Beirut. Now, regarding the, uh, regarding the pre-genocide era Armenians. 
OK、うん、持っていないと Just very briefly,、uh, the Armenians encountered Lebanon, came to Lebanon、uh, in, in pre Christian times, in, in 55 BC, around 55 BC,、uh, when、uh, the Emperor Tigran, the only em em emperor we had, okay, he con conquered Lebanon.、Uh, then、uh, there was a period when we、uh, came to Armenia. Uh, came to Lebanon uh, as, crusade, uh, as ally, allies to、um, the Crusaders and as a pilgrimage road to、uh, Jerusalem. And、uh, later on in the 18th, 19th century, Lebanon was considered a safe haven area for us. In 1860,、uh, we, when uh, uh, Mount Lebanon was established、uh, as a political entity, as an,、um, as a, as an autonomous political entity, the first, the first governor and the last governor of that、uh, Governorate of that autonomous area, Mount Lebanon area, around 4,000 square kilometers, were Armenians.、Uh, the first one was Dawud Basha, and the last one was o h a n e s Basha g o y m j a n Then, of course, I have to speak about the post 1920 era, Armenian as, Armenians as, ref, as refugees and、uh, whatever. Now,、uh, let me start with、uh, already I spoke about a bit about、um, uh, Armenians in Phoenicia、uh, when uh, Tigranes, the, 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 empire came,、uh, the emperor, came to.、Uh, Conquered the area, and that's no. This is the map of、uh, the, the Armenian Empire.、Uh, this is the only time when、uh, Armenians had such a huge,、uh, con controlled such a huge uh, area. Uh, not only this, but during the Tigra Tigranes, uh, the, the, em the, Emperor, uh, the Emperor Tigranes, it was the first time and the only time when.、Uh, Armenia proper, I mean the highland, Armenian highland was totally under Armenian occupation. That's the only time in,、uh, in the Armenian history. Now, then I want to speak a bit about just to touch upon、um, the Crusader area. We're talking about 10th, 11th, 12th centuries. And、um, this is very interesting.、Um, there were several,、uh, so、several ways of、um, alliances between、uh, the Armenian kingdom or the, the Armenian state of、uh, Cilicia、uh, and the Crusaders.、Uh, one of them was a, new,、uh, a good number of Armenian soldiers. Soldiers participated、uh, with the Crusaders in the conquest of this area, of the Middle East. Another way was uh, uh, diplomatic marriages. Armenian、um, queens, Cilician, queen,、uh, Cilician Armenian queens, got married to Crusaders, Crusader kings, and、uh, eventually got hold of.、Uh, got hold of、uh, the Kingdom of Jerusalem, for instance. Now, um, uh, This third, third this one is quite、uh, self explanatory. Intermarriage with political undertones. The Crusaders could not actually、uh, marry with women who were、uh, locals. They had to be Christians, okay? And they had to have a high status.、Uh, Princely status, and the only princely status that existed then were the, had the Armenians. So they had to marry the Armenians.、Uh, and of course, this produced a politi political gains for them in the sense that, well, the Armenians knew the area, and this was a way of integrating into the、uh, local milieu and, uh, uh, and having a better control. Now,、uh, then I have to speak a bit about Mount Lebanon as a safe haven in the sense that because of the purges and、uh, persecutions during the different、uh, eras of the Ottoman Empire, the Armenians had to、uh, flee.、Uh, Certain Armenians had to flee this area,、uh, the Ottoman Empire, and go to Mount Lebanon, particularly Mount Lebanon, as a safe haven. And、um, I have to make a correct correction here. It's not only、uh, persecution from、uh, the state or the Ottoman Empire, but from Orthodox Armenians as well. Because there were Catholic Armenians and they were persecuted, so they had to flee the area. They had to go to an area which is Christian and which is under Ottoman control, but、uh, where they had more freedom to,、um, 
to worship their God. And in this, in this sense, uh, the Catholic Armenians established themselves in the uh, early 18th century, 702, 3, 4, 710. They, they founded two monasteries and eventually uh, settled in a third monastery, which is the Bzomar um, um, monastery. It was founded in 1748, still exists, and it's the uh, oldest Armenian uh, historical icon in Lebanon. <coughs> Uh, Mount Lebanon was a safe haven for the Armenians, particularly uh, Catholic Armenians, because Mount Lebanon is a, is a Catholic uh, uh, has, a, has a Catholic community. The Maronites are Catholic in, base, in, uh, in uh, basically. Now, uh, this is uh, the uh, Bzumar Monastery uh, on the that's the monastery. Uh, this is their group in 1911. Um, and just, just a picture of uh, uh, the Bzomar Monastery and its community. Uh, yes. Now, uh, I spoke a bit about the Mutasarifate, the, the Mount Lebanon governorate. The, the, the picture is uh, the first uh, governor of uh, Mount Lebanon, Dawud Bashal Armani. Uh, he governed the area between 1860 and 1866, uh, a bit more. And uh, the picture of uh, the second picture is the cover of a book uh, written by Ohanes Pasha Kuimjan. He was the last governor, as I said. Now, um, uh, Dawud Bashal Armani. It was a very trying times for him because right before him it was a civil war going on in uh, Mount Lebanon between the Maronites and the Druzes. So he had to calm that down. Uh, there was a power sharing problem and he was able to uh, fairly enough uh, uh, control the area and not only control but uh, reconcile the different uh, rivalries that existed, that the contests that, that existed. Eventually this helped in what? It helped in two, two things. First, one of the things is that the army, uh, the local communities started uh, seeing, perceiving Armenians as peacemakers. Uh, second, they were, uh, the Armenians were considered as a, uh, Dawud Basha and his role was considered as a reference point regarding the, uh, the Armenians who came later on as, as refugees. So uh, there, was a, there was a positive mood and atmosphere and uh, uh, perception regarding the Armenians thanks to Daud Bashal Armani and Ohanes Pasha Kuyumjan who was the last uh, uh, Armenian governor. Now, I have to speak a bit about the Armenians in uh, uh, before in the pre-genocide era, the last three decades. I'm talking about 1880s until 1915. Now, um, in, in this period, there were around, as I said earlier, around 2,000 Armenians. Uh, a group of them were were Protestants. They lived in uh, the Ar uh, American University of Beirut uh, region. They were professors, and uh, some of them were uh, converted. Uh, the, uh, uh, converted from Orthodox Armenian to uh, Protestantism, and they helped actually in translating the, the Bible into Arabic. Another group was the Cat were, were the Catholics, as I said, they were in uh, the Bzomar area particularly, and there were uh, there was another group, Ar Armenian Orthodox, in Beirut as agents, as trade agents, or actually they had shops or uh, they were outlets of uh, the, the 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 mainland uh, uh, of the mainland um, uh, trade centers, uh, Armenian trade centers in. Uh, Central Anatolia and other parts. Uh, but I have to admit, I, I have to say as well that um, these three groupings uh, did not identify themselves as Armenians fully because uh, the, 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 the concept of identity in those days was not that uh, clear cut. Another point I have to make is that these three groupings, the Protestants in um, uh, the AUB region, Beirut region, uh, the, the, the Armenian Orthodox in, uh, again, the traders and what have you, and the Catholic they were not in good relations with each other. I mean, there was not a, uh, a strong network between these three groupings. But um, we have proofs of, um, this is, uh, so these are some tombstones uh, from the symmetry which doesn't exist anymore. I don't know whether it's that clear, uh, but the, some of the dates go, go back until 1866, 1860. Uh, the next thing I want to show is, um, is uh, the, the, the books published 
in uh, in pre-genocide Lebanon. Uh, these there are uh, five books have been published. All of them uh, are published in um, uh, uh, Armenian letters, but in Turkish. Okay, and they were published in 1880s, 1890s, particularly 1894, in, in specific, if you'd like to. Now, uh, then we come, when then we cross to the uh, refugee period. Early, uh, I have to divide this area, the, the 1920s onwards area uh, section, into several uh, parts. The first one should be between 1920s and 1950, until late 1940s. Then, from 1950 to 1975, I'd say, with a with a with a with a break between 19. 50 and 65, and from 65 to 75. Of course, there's the, the next uh, sec, uh, section between 1975 and 1990, and from 1990 onwards. I'll start with the, the early stage, the settlement stage. These are some of the refugees who came uh, uh, from Cilicia after 1920. Actually, if you want to, the right date, they came in um, right after the Anglo-French uh, uh, agreement, which was, uh, if I'm not wrong, in uh, November 1920. So the, the, these came uh, right after that, right after the uh, agreement, and they were. Uh, th this is their second sort of exile. But, but they, for the first time, they were they came to Beirut. These are the tents. Some of the pictures are, uh, well, one of the pictures is from uh, Syria, Damascus, but actually uh, the picture is the same. Now, the first picture up is, uh, you can see the sea, that's, the, that's Beirut, and uh, uh, looking towards west. And, uh, uh, and in the... Yeah, you can, you can, you have to see. You you may see the the tents, um, which are located um, uh, at the suburb, uh, just at the entrance of uh, the capital Beirut. Well, I'll come to that. Now, um, just a chronological disorder. This is 1916, and we're talking about the Intura orphanage. So we're talking about the pre-genocide pre-genocide era, era, sort of during World War One, when. Uh, uh, there was an orphanage in Aintura, around 1,100 or 1,200 orphans were homed there. Most of them were Armenians and around three to 400 Kurds. And it was planted in that area, the orphanage was planted for, well, this is what the, the, the literature talks about, is that they were planted there so that they could be uh, Turkified and eventually the Mount Lebanon area could be colonized as a Turkish uh, colony. Uh, the, 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 the symmetry down, down uh, below the picture, uh, below the, the group picture, is uh, some of these orphans uh, died during those, the, those years and this is their symmetry. Now, then I come to, uh, as I said, I, I return to the, the, the post-genocide and the settlement era. And you see here the, the orphan, you have to see here the orphanages. Uh, the Armenians were planted all uh, on the sea coast of Lebanon, from uh, Tripoli, uh, the northernmost uh, city, down to uh, Sur, the southernmost uh, city. Uh, the second, yeah, the second, the picture at the middle, this is uh, an identity card of an orphan of uh, the, the AGB, Armenian General Benevolent Union Orphanage. The next one is the nearest relief uh, orphanage. Uh, the second picture, this one, is uh, is located. Uh, this is a near, near released orphanage, and this is located in Antilias. The Catholic estate currently uh, is located at the same place, uh, right before the Catholic estate. Uh, the, the the area, the, the location of the Catholic estate was previously a near re relief uh, orphanage. Um, I'm just showing some of the pictures. Oh, now, the the uh, next important part, point regarding the orphanages is uh, the crafts. Uh, these orphanages were not only teaching Armenian, uh, they uh, made these orphans learn crafts. Uh, they were cobblers, they were carpenters, so many things. Uh, another, I, I, these are a group of uh, stamps uh, issued in 1924. 
These were originally issued as Lebanese stamps, but they have um, surcharge, surcharge on them. I mean, they were stamped again for the second time, and it, uh, it's, if I read it in Arabic, it's Ihanat lil which is um, uh, supporting the refugees. So the extra amount went to the Armenian orphans, uh, to the Armenian refugees, actually, and it was a state-sponsored uh, act. Now, I spoke a bit about the orphanages. This is one of the... Uh, the, the orphanages used to not only um, help orphans to become uh, carpenters and cobblers and what have you, but uh, also as uh, they, they wove carpets. This is uh, one of the carpets which was uh, handed or uh, sent as a gift to the White House. Um, I have come across another uh, carpet, the uh, rug actually. This is uh, woven again in uh, Ghazir, one of the orphanages. It was a, uh, an orphanage for the blinds. Now, uh, we saw already the tents. Uh, Aisha, just tell me the truth. Is it, is it okay or shall I do what? Uh, you, 15 minutes plus, you have another 25 minutes. All right, I think it's enough, I think it's enough. Okay, now we saw the tents, just not more than three to five years, did, the tents didn't exist anymore. Instead of the tents, we had shanty towns. Okay, the camps were replaced by shanty towns. And the shanty towns were not, uh, were, stayed until the 1970s, uh, mid 70s. Okay, but a part of these shanty towns were, bro were brought down and uh, buildings. Constructions, stone constructions were already uh, seen as of the 30s. Late 1928, you see already Armenian settlements in certain areas just at the entrance of uh, the capital Beirut. I'll come to this uh, factor later on, the, the, the importance of the refugees settling at the entrance of uh, Beirut rather than anywhere else. Now, this is the 1920s, uh, late 1920s, early 1930s, I don't know, uh, Burshamud is quite quite famous, maybe some of you could have heard about him, about it. It was established in the late, uh, in, in 1932. I'll come to, I'll, I'll show some pictures later on. Um, of course, the, 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 ten, the tent areas and the shanty towns, uh, town areas are not the same as the settlement areas. So they had to leave the tent areas, they had to leave the shanty towns, Actually, the shanty towns and the tents were the same, were located at the same place. But they had to leave that area for some, uh, 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 maybe a kilometer, okay, and to go to another area. Now, um, I'm talking, now I have to speak a bit about the uh, mid-twenties, late-twenties, Lipanan, the uppermost uh, newspaper was established in 1924. It's one of the oldest Armenian newspapers. It doesn't exist anymore. It star, uh, survived until mid-30s, early 40s. The next one is Pini, uh, which uh, later on in 1926 changed names into name into uh, it became Nor Punig, New Punig, and Punig, and Punig is the Phoenix, Phoenix, and eventually it turned into Astag which still exists. Now, this is in the 20s, late tw mid 20s, late 20s. While the other two newspapers, uh, Zartonk, Zartonk was established in 1937. Just a month later, Ararat started. Okay, another newspaper, all of them, all these three are daily newspapers currently, do they, they do exist. The first one, uh, each one belongs to a party. Uh, Armenian parties. Okay, now uh, I showed you one of the stamps, uh, showed you the stamps. Here it's more clear, se clear. Secur or a refugee. And, uh, well, I had to do a, I mean, I, had, I have an emotional point. Uh, this is my grandfather's uh, identity card of Lebanon, res residential uh, identity card of, uh, of Lebanon. As you see, it's 1931. So, in my case, in my grandparents' case, they came from uh, Iraq in 1930. So, it doesn't mean that all of the Armenians who are in Lebanon came from, 
uh, came in the early 1920s, and we'll come to that later on. Um, still, we're talking about the 1920s, 40s period. Uh, we have to see something. We have to, it's very specific. The 1920s up to the 1940s, we have an outflow and inflow of Armenians to Lebanon. Uh, there is an outflow because of economic difficulties in Lebanon, and a good number of Armenians live to uh, Latin America, Southern America. Uh, while in 1938-39 in particular, around 12,000 Armenians come to Lebanon from uh, Hatay area, Sanja uh, Alexandretta area, okay, because of the accession of the area to uh, Turkey, contemporary Turkey. They come to, particularly they come to uh, Lebanon and uh, Anjar area and uh, southern Lebanon. And of course, there is another out, there is another outflow of Lebanese Armenians, if we may call them so. Uh, around twenty thousand, no, around uh, eighteen thousand, eighteen to twenty thousand Armenians leave Lebanon and Syria to uh, Soviet Armenia in between 1948, uh, 46, and 1948. Uh, okay, summary of the period. We have, so, uh, between 1920 and 19, uh, late 1940s, we have to speak about the settlement of the Armenians into the area. There is an inflow and outflow. There is reconstruction. These Armenians are refugees, so they reconstruct their lives. Uh, differently from whatever their past was. Uh, so they have a new beginning of life. And there starts, to, there, there starts the process of integration to the Lebanese uh, in general. We're talking about political integration, we're talking about social integration, but definitely we start with the political integration, which starts in 1924, actually, af right after the Lausanne uh, Treaty, which uh, entitles the refugee Armenians to get Lebanese citizenships. This is very important because it gave the Lebanese Armenians security regarding, um, regarding um, uh, the local population in the sense that, well, no one would come and harass them that, what are you doing? doing here, you don't have a residential visa and what have you. So this is very important. Now we, I cross to the 1950-65 era, which is the era of stability, prosperity, and domestic strife. Domestic strife, I mean intra-Armenian strife. So you have, in this period, you have the growth of the orphans, and they are already producing. Uh, they have helped hugely to the local market because of the World War One, World, World War Two era. There was a blockade, and uh, um, you couldn't have, you couldn't, you weren't enabled to um, import goods. So the local Armenian orphans who had become already craftsmen, they started producing and making money, of course. Uh, the schools, the Armenian schools who, who were established in the early 1920s, late 1920s, they were elementary schools. They start becoming secondary schools. Okay, uh, You have the, the only university in the diaspora, 1955, Haigazian University. You have economic, significant economic abundance, but of course you have the impact of the Cold War, which means that you had domestic strife. I mean, there was a rivalry between the different Armenian parties, not only between the different Armenian parties, but the, the Lebanon, Lebanon underwent a civil war in 1958. So within this civil war, the Armenians had their, had their own civil war, sort of. Okay? And uh, um, at least I have a list of uh, around 55 youngsters killed uh, fret, uh, killed by Armenians. Armenians killed each other. Uh, well, the, 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 there is a claim that the number is much higher, around 250, but uh, at this stage we have around 55, uh, 60 names. And of course, in the newspapers you can't find a new, he was killed because or particularly later on. Um, I'll show you some pictures, newspaper pictures of the time. Most of them, all of them is in Armenian. Um, now, and this is, uh, this is uh, the newspapers of the time, Astag, Arad, and Zartong, the three rivaling uh, party newspapers, uh, which uh, are uh, censored. Censorship. Censored. Censored. The state has censored it because they have written too many ugly things against the other. OK? 
okay? Uh, as if promoting hatred towards each other, and not only towards each other, but uh, uh, creating further animosity and uh, strife within the community and the Lebanon in general. Uh, but of course this is not all, uh, and the strife is not only inter-party uh, inter -party rivalry, but there are other things as well. Now, the pictures up there, these are uh, victims killed by Armenians. They are Armenians killed by the other party, the rivaling party. Okay? As for the... Uh, as for the Zartong, the third one, okay, what I read is, this is a reflection of the Cold War, okay? And the Cold War was very strongly reflected in the Armenian newspapers of the 50s, late 50s, I'm talking about 1958. Not only international rivalry, but at the same time, the rivalry had uh, come into the Armenian church as well. We have the problem of uh, the Catholic Cossate. Who was going to be elected as a Catholic Cossate? Was, was, was he to be someone uh, pro-Soviet, anti-Soviet, pro-American, pro-West, pro-East, pro... So there was a problem. So there was as if this rivalry spilled over other things, our other power resources. Um, I don't know whether I need to, sh uh, to continue in this regard. You can see that this rivalry is not only a local Armenian ri li rivalry, but it's a rivalry between different groupings, different within the Lebanese community and outside the Lebanese community. It's a rivalry between uh, different countries of the Middle East, Jordan, where Brit the British forces uh, uh, come in, uh, Egypt, uh, Syria, Iraq in particular, Iran, so you have so many problems. It's the same. So, to conclude the 1950-65 era, uh, the, the, it had a happy ending, sort of. In 1963, uh, there was a reconciliation between Antilias and uh, Hmiadzin, the two uh, heads of the, of the Armenian church. Uh, the, there was the, the beginning of the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the 50th anniversary of the Armenian genocide. Beirut had become, in the, in the, between 1950 and 65 particularly, had Beirut had turned into the capital of the diaspora, and particularly certain aspects, all the party centers were in Beirut, uh, the headquarters. The church had uh, their, its centers there as well. And it radiated, definitely, uh, Beirut radiated nationalism uh, to the Armenian diaspora space. If you have questions regarding nationalism, I have my, my uh, theory about that. I'll, I may explain it later on. Now, as I said, there was a reconciliation. You see the Santa, Santa Claus, you see Santa Claus collecting the weapons, and uh, you see uh, the, the tree being repaired, and you see the two Catholic co uh, koi, uh, meeting on, uh, in Jerusalem in, uh, on 26th October 1963 as a reconciliation. Of course, this was factual, but it, not fully, it wasn't fully translated under the, on the ground. Now I come to the 1965-75 era. This is the peak of the Lebanese-Armenian community. This is the time when the Lebanese Armenian community, and by the way, I'll come to that. Uh, the Leb when I speak about the Lebanese Armenian community, I don't mean that all the Lebanese Armenians are Lebanese. Because there was, as I said earlier, there was an inflow and outflow. But in, during these periods, this period in particular, there was a huge inflow from Syria, from Turkey, from Iraq, from Egypt, from all the area, to, uh, of, for, from all the neighboring states to Lebanon because it, was, it had a market economy, free economy. Uh, there was liberalism. Armenians were freer to do, I mean, they had their cultural uh, autonomy. So the num not necessarily all, the, all these, uh, these Armenian Lebanese are considered Lebanese. They, I, don't, I mean, they don't have the citizenship. A good number of them. Okay, so uh, in 1976, between 1965 and 75, you have the largest Christian community in Beirut. Armenians were the largest community, Christian community in Beirut. Uh, they were the second largest uh, community, Christian community in Lebanon. Okay, uh, their number was uh, they they constituted around eight eight percent of the Lebanese population, but they had uh, the the, the uh, a, 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 some a, a bank assets of up to twenty five percent of the 
whole uh, bank accounts in Lebanon. Uh, and they had been turned into the, the economic tiger of Lebanon. Then I have to speak definitely about the Lebanese war years. This, these years were uh, terrible for us and for all the, all the communities. Actually, you know that the, the Lebanese Armenians did not participate in the war. Uh, they were, we were not neutral I, because neutrality is something negative. We were uh, positive. It's a, it's a French statement, uh, phrase. It's uh, neutralité positive positive neutrality, which meant that, yes, we are not fighting, we are neutral in the, for, in the war, but we are positively involved in the war in the sense that we are ready to help the two groups, fighting groups, uh, to, um, uh, to, put, to bring them together to the negotiation table. The positivity is bringing them to the negotiation table. Unfortunately, the community was not that strong, or uh, I would say the, the, the fighting parties were stronger and uh, their drives were, were, were much stronger than the uh, power and the ability of the Armenian community to bring them to uh, negotiation tables. Uh, the Armenians did not fight, did not get into the war because they had the lesson. They had learned the, the lesson of 1958. They had killed already each other, so they had learned the lesson. They shouldn't, they wouldn't repeat it. Plus, there was a good uh, leverage of uh, Armenian civil society members who were Non-partisans. This non-partisanship was very important. They were the leverage with, who uh, sort of deterred, I may say, the parties to getting involved into, or were used actually as an excuse for those parties to uh, push the argument that, okay, now, maybe the, the Dashnak party or the Hunchak party would like to join, okay? But they had an excuse in the sense that they could say to their formal allies, uh, the, the progressive parties or the Kataevs or whoever, they could say yet that, well, we want to join, but we have a huge majority who is, un who is unwilling to join. So there was this good excuse. I think the, 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 the parties made good use of it. There was another reason for... Uh, not getting involved in the war is that because we had already uh, est taken steps towards uh, unifying our efforts, the parties, I'm talking about the parties. And the, uh, one of the basic uh, reasons of this unification, causes of this unification, was uh, the 50th anniversary of the Armenian genocide. Okay, it helped us a lot, it helped the parties a lot to avoid uh, getting divided again. And of course, Turkey helped us a lot in this regard. Because in 1970, it's very interesting. In 1970, Turkey uh, came up with a, uh, applied for a, uh, how would I put it, a complaint against two Armenian newspapers in Lebanon. The Tashnag Astak and the Ramgavar Zartong. These, uh, 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 as, uh, and the blame was that these two, par these two newspapers had um, used bad words regarding Turkey. Okay, now this is fine. But the problem, it, it backfired in the sense that uh, now the Ramgavars and the Tashnaks saw that, well, the Turkey is not attacking only the Dashnaks, but it's attacking the Ramgavars. So they had a common cause. So this common cause enabled and helped actually the parties to get together rather than to fight against each other because they were already witnessing that there is a common cause. This is very interesting. Uh, then we have the 1975-1990 war and uh, and its consequences. I don't want to speak about the 1975-1990 war. It's terrible. Uh, all I can say that I was kidnapped twice at least. So, but definitely we had the consequences. We had dwindling numbers of Armenians. Yani the, the number of the Armenians went down. We were 225 and above. Now we were not more than 120 and it still decreasing. Uh, even though the parties and the community was able to control, not participating in the war, but we couldn't control, I mean, the, the, the authorities, the Armenian authorities, couldn't control the outflow of the Armenians. Do I have time? All right. Uh, 
and we were after right after 1990 we had we were forced to reshape the community now we had 56 schools then before 1975 up till 1990 now the number had gone down by Two thirds. So, what do we do with the with the, with the dwindling number of students? We have to bring them down. Okay. So, we had to uh, reconstruct our uh, community outlets. But alongside these, there are other there were other problems between 1990 and 200, uh, 2010. We we have the independence of Armenia. This was a new. Uh, situation, it, it created new situation, new conditions for us, the Karabakh war and self-independence, the Lebanese limbo, because right after the, Lebanese, uh, the, the, the civil war, it, the, the civil war is still going on without war. The civil strife is still on in Lebanon. Power sharing hasn't come to its final uh, shape yet. It's taking shape, but it's taking time as well. So we are in a transition period, the Lebanon, the, the state of Lebanon. We are in a transition period, and it's an ongoing pro so we have a instability to a certain stand, extent. Of course, there is this uh, diaspora mobility. Uh, we can see, I'll speak about it later on. Of course, there is this integration issue and reposition Armenia and Armenians in the world order. Now, I'll start with the independence of Armenia. I'll, I will not speak bit about it much. Uh, Armenia, uh, Lebanon stopped becoming, the, the Lebanese Armenians, the, the Beirut as an Armenian community center, stopped becoming a, uh, a diaspora center or a capital because uh, the attention was diverted or, yes, diverted to the Republic of Armenia, the un incoming, uh, the inflow of uh, economic help, financial help from uh, Armenian uh, philanthropic organizations of the West almost stopped or was uh, strongly de uh, decreased. Um, the Karabakh war is quite interesting. Uh, if you have questions, I may ask. Uh, as I said, the, the Lebanese uh, limbo is, was the problem because there was not only the Lebanese transition period extended, but the, the whole region faced and still is facing this uh, transition period and instability. Uh, of course, at the same time, currently we are facing the world transition, world order transition, which is further uh, problematizing the situation in Lebanon and the region. Uh, I'll speak a bit about the diaspora instability, the changing nature of the diaspora, just, just titles. The generations have changed, which means a lot in the sense that their perception, their uh, understanding, their uh, um, definition of identity, their definition of fatherland, their de well, these, are the, uh, these, these new generations have been, were born in Beirut. Okay? So their fatherland, sort of, is Beirut, not, uh, Ottoman, um, not uh, Anatolia or Cilicia or Istanbul. Okay? Uh, there was a geographic remodeling in the sense that uh, before 1975, there were over half a million Armenians in the Middle East. Now it's not the same. Not only this part, but the other issue as well. Uh, currently, there is a huge number of Armenians, not only in the West, but in Moscow as well. So the whole diaspora geography has changed. Uh, there is a demographic shift, a shift as well. I spoke a bit about the uh, shifts in the value system. Life distraction, because of this uh, globalization era, we have a, se we have a sense of uh, being able to get involved in everything. So you are not uh, curtailed or limited to an Armenia or to a local communal uh, sphere. You are open. Uh, these were very uh, important problems. And of course, you have the problem of, if it is a problem, uh, to a certain extent maybe, the integration. There was a reshuffling of priorities. This new generation has different priorities. Uh, a new world uh, perception, mixed marriages, decrease in the usage of Armenian language. Shifts to English-oriented communal productions. Uh, before 1975, we had a huge Lebanese Armenian economic space. We don't have it anymore. Okay, sustainability concerns is very important currently because of the com because of the uh, um, financial ability of the community. The financial uh, ability of the community has decreased. If it has decreased, then definitely it cannot sustain. It can cannot maintain the community outlets. This is a very 
important and uh, difficult uh, issue for us. I, and of course, as I said, uh, reshaped um, identity. This is all I have to say. These are some of the pictures which show the, uh, the integration process. Uh, the previous one was uh, uh, covers of uh, books uh, written in Armenian back in the, uh, until 1950s, between 30s and 50s, which speak about the, Armenian, um, the Arabic language, how to learn Arabic language, to know more, more about the Middle East and what have you. But this process stopped, sort of, or it didn't uh, develop uh, naturally uh, until 1975. Okay? After 1975, you have the 1990 era, where you have um, uh, an integration process very uh, obviously moving on. You have Armenian painters on, Arme uh, on Arabic uh, media. Uh, I think this is all. Okay, so conclusion. You have four stages in the last hundred year years of Lebanese-Armenian history. This history is shaped under the influence of local, international, and self-made factors. Uh, it is a reflection of the huge efforts of a refugee community in reconstructing a new past, present and the past, of course, and a leading and a shaping role in the diaspora and its identity, uh, which had a multifactorial, which had a multifactorial production. Uh, in the beginning uh, of my presentation, I said I will highlight the life and socioeconomic and cultural output of the Lebanese Armenians. Eventually, it is the survival stro story of a refugee native community and the transformations of its identity. Thank you. Hello. As a, as a post, postscriptum, I left so many open-ended uh, discussions, raised unanswered questions, did not touch on certain aspects for you to pick whatever and start an interesting talk. And uh, once again, at the beginning I had to, but I didn't, I think. I, uh, once again, I had to thank the Hranding Foundation for this wonderful opportunity because, uh, and the encounter actually. It only brings humans closer to each other, brings down fault lines, and makes us understand each other better. Thank you. <laughs>